There are no redos in life, or so we think. The MC also shares this sentiment, but deep down, he clings to a flicker of hope, wishing for a life without regrets if given another shot. The story begins with two young kids begging and kneeling for help in front of our protagonist. As usual, the people misunderstand his actions, whispering about how cruel and heartless he is to make such young kids beg. Amid this unexpected scenario, the MC, sweating heavily, makes a revelation.
to be picked up. She also wants the same treatment. He obviously complies with her request. Lutz wants to be held, but since Gray's arms are full, he is told to wait for his turn, and he politely nods. Gray shares the good news that the new house has been bought, and in two days, after the necessary arrangements have been made, they will be able to move there. After all the kids have gone to sleep, area included, he is heading out to deal with the spider gang. Stella is awoken by the noise and asks if he is leaving for work. He responds with an affirmation to her question. She then quickly asks him if he will return back, to which he has the same response, and further tells her not to worry since they will be living together from now on. She tells him not to get hurt and he replies that he will make sure not to, since he does not want her to worry. Stella tells him that everyone will worry not just herself. As Grace gets up to leave, Stella asks for one final request. 
She says that one day he must tell them the reason he chose to become their daddy. He says that is not a difficult request and he can answer it right away. But she tells him that she does not want to hear it now and would rather prefer to hear his answer when everyone else is also awake. Gray is left wondering if she can somehow see right through him, which in this case is not a bad feeling. So with renewed vigor, he comes out to meet his two old pals still bound and gagged by rope and tape. With a wicked smile on his face and focused on trying to make a better life for his kids, he gets the two thugs to guide him towards the spider hideout. After the thugs lead him to their base, they start begging for their lives, pleading that they will change and how they do not want to die. Promising that they will begin a new life and never go after the kids again, but Gray does not want to leave any loose ends. He had already given them a last chance, and they were the ones foolish enough to throw that chance away. Letting them live would also be a constant threat to the livelihood of the kids and probably other people as well. He also just wants to quickly get this over with since he does not want Nina to get sad or Stella to worry. As he approaches the house guarded by two shady looking people, he is stopped and one of them asks him who he is supposed to be. Even though he already looks like a person who does not live an honest life, they cannot just let him enter. This angers him, but he remains as cool and tells them that he is an adventurer. Gray asks if this is the rapacious spider's guild, and after a brief pause, the man asks how he knows that. That was all Gray needed to confirm. He instantly deals with the guy with a fatal and quick blow, ensuring that they cannot rise as undead. The people on the inside are just like brushing insects off the grass for Gray as he effortlessly breezes through the rooms. He makes sure not to use any magic since he does not want to give off his location entirely. The spider's basement is typical of thug-like people, large and spacious to help them carry out their evil deeds without any intruding eyes. A large and looming fellow who claims to be a former B-rank adventurer shows up. With his big sword and eye patch, he seems to be quite the strong opponent, but he too is struck down in one blow by Gray. He is also even lower in level as compared to Ganz's according to Gray. An assassin sneaks up and attacks him from the ceiling, but Gray dodges it and also cuts off his head using his signature strike. These assassin types are still stronger as compared to big oafs like the previous person. He catches the last person who tries to run away after looking at the mess of headless corpses lying around, but Gray catches up to him and asks him to lead him to the boss's room with his sinister smile. The defeated man leads him to a place and presses a lever only to lead him towards a trap. A net is thrown from up top and he easily cuts the flimsy ropes off, cursing them and himself for falling for such a basic trap. He finally reaches the boss's place, where the boss is sitting on a grand chair in the middle of a large web. He remarks that he is surprised as the reports that claimed there was a single intruder were actually true. Then he asks what his relation to the kids is, and why he's so determined to save and protect them. Gray replies that he is their father, and that he is too tired and busy to drag this on for any longer, telling him that he can just beg on his knees and apologize to the people he hurt in the afterlife. The boss is shocked and tells Gray to wait if he wants to know about the truth about those kids. But before we can learn more about his thoughts about the kids, the scene abruptly shifts to the following day where the kids are attempting to awaken Gray from his slumber. Nina and Stella are giving him little pokes while Ariamal, the wise one, tells him to leave him be. Meanwhile, Gray contemplates the age-old dilemma of whether he should rise and shine or keep on dreaming. Back at the inn, the inn master is talking to his daughter about how the infamous rapacious spider guild was completely wiped out in one single night. They were a relatively large guild with many fighter types. They were known to get in fights with the town's guard and even gave the elite guards trouble. As far as he has heard, everyone in the base was headless and killed. Even the daughter, Lena, says that it was what everyone was talking about in the market as well. Considering the amount of fame and glory one could receive, no one has yet stepped up to claim this in the event of not angering and making the real killer to go after them. Gray is also there at the table, only occasionally groaning to show that he is also part of the conversation. He redirects the flow of the conversation and tells the inn master how they were talking about that Gray has been in his care all this time. The inn master, as usual, had completely forgotten what they were talking about and just liked the idle chatter. Lena is also involved in all this as she cannot imagine Grayson leaving after all this time. He says that it has been a long time and that when the first time he came, she was still just a little baby and really scared of his face. She does not seem to remember it since she was so small, but nonetheless still apologizes. The inn master tells Gray that should he ever need anything, he should not hesitate to come and ask. The next day, all the kids are ready to leave and Gray had planned to buy some new clothes, but now he thinks that they should all stop first at the bathhouse. 
So after a slight change in plans, they arrive at the bathhouse, and Gray asks for two private rooms, one for the girls and one for the boys. Ariamol, Theo, Stella, and Nina are going to meet them afterward. Nina naively asks Grayson if he too can come with them. The staff members are laughing due to the cuteness and awkwardness of the situation. Aria is able to handle the situation well and distracts Nina by telling her that if she listens to their commands, she will get a lot of hugs. She happily agrees and everyone is again at rest. At the men's bath, Gray tells Lutz to sit down and let him wash his hair. As he is scrubbing it with his ever-present ominous smile, he is thinking how he always wanted to experience these types of parent-child moments. He tells Ishuka that he will also wash his hair but he is shy and says it's fine, and that he feels embarrassed. He however accepts and also gets his head scrubbed thoroughly by Grayson. It takes the girls a little bit longer and Lutz has already slept in the meanwhile. Aria starts apologizing profusely but Gray tells her it is fine. Later, at the clothing store, the employee there is trembling at the sight of Gray. She has a hard time just saying the regular greeting that she is trained to say to everyone. After trying different clothes for the kids, Nina is excited to show her frilly dress, which instantly captures Gray's heart and puts him in a slight daze. Even the lady at the store is finding her pretty, and Gray is a whole in general much warmer than before. Finally, they arrive at the house and all the kids are stunned by the sheer size and beauty of it. They start running around and exploring but are stopped by the ever-cautious Asuka and Theo. They warn the younger kids on how not to run up the stairs. Gray tells them that the individual rooms are on the top floor, and it is first-come, first-served basis. Ariamal, being the oldest and most socially sensible, is hesitant in choosing her room. She says that she will choose last and that the master bedroom should go to Gray. He says that she should have it since the kids would want to stay with her, but she insists on taking the normal-sized room. Gray knows that it will still take time before they get comfortable and start making requests willfully so he does not push this topic any further. He suggests that the little ones can stay with him or Aria, whichever they feel like until they are big enough to want their own separate rooms. Now that he has secured their housing, food, and clothing, all that's left is their education. In this world, there is a fancy and posh academy that kids can attend. They begin usually at the age of 12, but it has little to do with any actual learning and more to do with building friendships and bonds. He is also a bit unsure about this because if the noble children do bully them, he does not know if he will be able to control his anger and lash out on them. Maybe he should ask the children if they have any specific dreams or plans for the future. He did not let the spider boss man tell him about the secret of the kids as he believes in privacy and consent. He thinks that he will get to know about it as they live together and if they feel like sharing it. It is not that he does not care about their past, rather he values it too much and does not want to force them, or anyone else for that matter, to share it with him until they are sure about it themselves. Even family members have secrets, and it is not like he will just stop supporting them after he finds out if they have a dark past. He is fully set on guiding and taking care of the children no matter what. As he is preparing his bed to call it a night, he hears a knock. After opening the door, all the kids are standing there since they are still unable to sleep alone due to sleeping together all the time. Gray welcomes them in, telling that he will spread the futons. Thus their big day comes to an end. Gray ponders that it's similar to how they were before at the humble shack, but it's fine. He's reminded of the last moment he spent with his previous family. If he had known that was his last time with them, he would have made sure to cherish it. The next morning, Gray gets some new groceries and food-related items. Contemplating the freshness of the food, he smirks wickedly, considering that children deserve a meal that is easy to digest, and he plans to purchase meat for them at the right moment. Upon receiving the food, they express gratitude towards Gray. He also hands Aria his cooking guidebook and recipes, stating that he won't be coming every day, informing him that the three younger children are still asleep. She invites him to take a moment to see them before leaving. Gray ponders that this resemble a father leaving for a business trip, but he is pleased to see them all huddled together in a peaceful post. Aria then asked if he was able to sleep well, even though Nina threw a tantrum last night. He says it was no big deal and bids his farewell. They asked him if they will have the opportunity to see him again, and he assures them, saying of course. With a smirk on his face, he reveals his new plan is to make some money. A bit later we see an elder orc running away with a deranged look caused by fear. Clearly, an even scarier and more fearsome foe is chasing. Orcs do not consider humans to be of significant threat. They amount to livestock and cattle for orcs. Yet this one man was able to annihilate his entire platoon. 
That one man is none other than our protagonist Gray. He has been trying to aim for the orc's crotch for some time now, which is only increasing the amount of fear and panic within him. Gray has something he needs to buy, so he menacingly asks the orc to fork over whatever he's got, a true bully behavior yet for a good cause. Fio is furiously waking up Isuka for breakfast in the morning, shouting that everyone has already started and he is still sleeping on his bed. He reluctantly comes down and greets everyone. It has now been around a month since they started living together, and there has been an influx of a lot of new subtle details, such as how Ishuka is not a morning person and how much difficulty he has in dragging his feet to the table every morning. Fio is sensible, Nina eats a lot and Stella has a sweet tooth. They are picky eaters nonetheless. Ariamal is taking care of the cooking today and Gray is helping with setting the table. Ari informs him that she made a copy of the recipe book using words instead of just pictures that Gray Son made for her. She is able to read and write which is quite a shock for Gray as many children do not know how to in this world. As he is leaving Nina tells Dada to come back early. While Lutz is outside with a cat, staring intensely at it. Gray asks Lutz if he can pass along his gratings to the cat as well and Lutz waves back as an affirmation. He does not speak too much but is able to converse with his eyes. He is especially good at this when using it on animals. There are still many things which are not known, but slowly and surely, they are each learning about one another as they share the living space. Gray's life has also changed quite a lot. Before, he only used to come to the inn in order to sleep or rest, or to prepare for an expedition. Now he only takes day quests so that he can get home by the evening and spend the night with his family. He is currently in the middle of raining hell on goblins near Bastok. He is always trying to quickly finish his work and head home as quickly as possible. This change in attitude is also noticed by others, such as Sasha, one of the guild's many receptionists. She makes a note on how he seems restless lately and that he has been ignoring Ganza's completely. Gray is startled by this and he asks if he has even been pestered by him at all lately. She affirms his suspicion by telling him that he is currently behind him. Gray asks whether this is some sort of horror genre. He does not even bother looking at Ganza's let alone waste time by bickering and arguing with him. He would rather just go home as soon as possible and read stories to Nina. On the way home, he picks seven donuts up from a lady selling them and she is terrified from his face as well. As he is walking home, it is quite a relaxing and dull day, the kind of day that makes the mind wander off to other places and times. He is starting to remember his previous life, how even though his entire family had passed away, he always used to greet them when entering and told them that he was leaving as he left the house. He knew it was meaningless, but some things you just cannot let go. As he reaches the house, Lutz and Nina are outside playing in the yard. They greet him as warmly as ever, and he holds them up and takes them inside. Harry also asks whether he wants to eat first or have a bath. Gray thinks everyone is hungry so they should have a nice meal first. He also hands a bag of donuts and tells her that this is for everyone to share later. Aria tells him that he has been bringing sweets every week and that it has been getting too much. Stella has even started to skip dinner because of this and it is not healthy for the others as well, so he should only bring it once in a while. Gray agrees. He used to think Ariamal was like an older sister, but he was wrong in that judgment. She is more like a mother. At dinner, Isuka and Fayo want to share something. They have thought about it a lot and plan on becoming adventurers. Will Grayson help them by teaching them all the basics about swordsmanship and magic? Aria does not want to hear any of this, but Ishuka and Fayo want to pick up their own burden. They also want to contribute to the household. They feel bad for only being on the receiving end. However, Gray does not have any problems with how things are going. He tells them that he does not have any opposition to that idea, but for now, they should set it aside. Later at night, when he is reading a story to Nina and the others, he is thinking about the conversation that took hold at dinner. He understands Aria's objection, as it is a dangerous profession. No one can predict what will happen and danger can strike from anywhere. However, the same can be said for life, and it will be better if one has the ability and skills to help themselves should the need arise. Not that he is planning on letting any sort of situations arise, but he does not want them to have any other hardships, having faced so many before already. He is conflicted and deep in thought when Stella calls for him. She is talking in her sleep and telling him it can cause a transformation. The next morning, everyone is at the breakfast table, once again thanking Ariamol for her cooking. Stella is making sure Gray knows that he is being stared at. Aria presents Gray Son a lunchbox for his lunch since he seems to have been skipping his meals lately. She also says that he does not need to accept it if he feels like it is a bother. 
but he gladly accepts it while thinking he would kill anyone who dared to refuse such a heartfelt offer. She seems a bit flustered and finally gathers the nerve to talk about the issue relating to Isuka and Theo. Gray comforts her by assuring that he will make sure they get supported no matter what they plan on doing in the future, and wants them to fulfill their dreams. He also understands her concerns and asks her to talk out her problems with them. She bids him goodbye and tells him to safely return home. The guild seems to be awfully noisy and crowded, indicating an event taking place or something of the sort. After asking Sasha, it becomes clear that today is the day that the ladies from the Valkyrie Guild are going to return from a particularly challenging dungeon, which no one had ever cleared before. Had Grey only been a little more aware of his surroundings, he would have noticed the flyers that have been posted for so long. Sasha will not be able to maintain her position at the counter as she is needed elsewhere, so she sternly warns him not to turn in any heads. This was also Melinda's request. She was crying when she asked Sasha to convey it to Grayson. This gets him thinking about how long it has been since he has entered any dungeons, quite a long time actually, a few years at the minimum. The interesting ones are full of troublesome monsters which are not really suited for solo combat. In rare cases, some are born with a special ability. Most of the time, it is impossible to know what ability the monster has without fighting and seeing it up close. He will probably do a goblin raid nearby again today. A special ability can be anything such as a goblin having complete magic immunity making him impervious to any and all magic attacks. This however does not change the rest of its abilities. A single powerful attack or cut will kill it as well as falling from a high place. So aside from that special ability, it would be a common goblin. Even if one has amazing archery ability, if it uses a club, it will be an easy target for a novice adventurer. On the flip side, if it is smart enough to capitalize on its ability, then it can become a truly fearsome foe for even some of the more seasoned veterans. Maybe there was a special ability possessor in the goblins he attacked yesterday. One of them moved relatively quicker than the other ones. It is probably similar to the ability or skills humans are born with, maybe even the exact same thing. However, saying this would cause a massive ruckus as the church would be very opposing to such ideas. In their minds, humans are the epitome of all creatures and are created and blessed by God. Gray has no such mindset. He thinks God has no priority. The extremely rare yet incredibly powerful skills, such as hero or saintess, may also be among monsters, according to this hypothesis. Eating the lunch given by Ariamal felt even more delicious when eaten outside in the open grassy landscape. He ponders that maybe it is time to take the entire family out for a picnic. Ariamal is pretty, cooks well, and generally a smart and well-mannered girl. The moment she steps outside, it will be inevitable that she brings home a boyfriend. Gray has to make sure he practices mentally for such an occasion, so he does not accidentally detach the head off of the boyfriend's shoulders. When he is reporting back at the guild, Melinda at the counter is not quick to hide her distaste and disgust to Grayson's face. She is super pleased when she sees that he has only brought the designated parts and not the head or other stuff. He asks if the Valkyrie girls have come back yet, and he is told they have returned and are upstairs currently. They are speaking with the guild master and Sasha Senpei. The girl goes on ranting about how beautiful the ladies in the guild are. Is Grey also perhaps interested in one of them? He is not, but she still does not let the topic go easily. He thinks it is better to let them relax since they have just returned from a tough expedition and not like they are going to leave soon. He wanted to ask them about the house but maybe some other time. He thinks about getting a treat but then remembers Arya's words, so stops before he makes the same mistake again. Returning home, he thanks Arya for the lunch, remembering to tell her that it was delicious. She promises to make one again tomorrow. After dinner, late at night, as the entire family is sitting in the living room lounge, there is an abrupt knock at the door. He is cautious as he is not expecting anyone this late at night and is pissed as well, but is met with a surprise at the door. It is none other than the people he wanted to meet. Two of the Valkyrie ladies are standing at his front door. It is the leader of the guild and A-plus ranked adventurer, Emilia, and the other is Kasha. After a quick greeting, she tells him it was very cold of him to just leave after knowing that they were upstairs in the guild without even coming and saying hi to them. He is pissed at Melinda and her loose mouth. Kasha asks him if he is going to invite them in as it has gotten late, and it is quite uncomfortable standing outside. Arya pops up from behind and asks Grey if these are his acquaintances, and if she should prepare some tea. The ladies are quite tensed when they see Arya and even mutter some sad words for her. Grey is oblivious to everything and invites them. 
Inside, Isuka asks Gray if they are his friends, and he replies that they used to be in the same party. And then Isuka and Theo greet them respectfully. Tea is served, and Nina and Stella are grabbing Gray as if to stop him from going anywhere. Aria says they are worried that he might be taken away from them. She quickly takes them away to stop the hindrance and annoyance they are causing in between the adults talking. Looking at these kids, Amelia, the guild leader, has even more questions now. Who are the children? Gray tells her calmly that they are his. This causes Amelia to resort to screaming and asking him who the mother is. Hearing the yelling, Nina starts getting scared and whimpering while clutching Gray even more tightly. She tells the two ladies that daddy is Nina's daddy. While Gray's worry is that his shirt will get dirty. Looking at this, Kasha tells Amelia to think about the kids and lower her voice as they are getting scared. She then takes a more reasonable route and asks Ariamel how old she is. She replies that she is 13. Kasha then tells Amelia that according to this logic he would have children when he was still in the party with them. And the person who Gray was dating was none other Amelia, so Amelia quickly stops her mid-sentence. Kasha then voices her worries about Stella and how she is a half or a quarter vampire. This obviously makes Stella uncomfortable and nervous, but Gray comforts her and tells her that these two ladies will not be hurting her in any way. After a long sigh, Gray assures the Valkyries that he will clear all the details, from the beginning all the way till now. After listening to it, they tell him how he never changes and how quickly he always lends a hand to the needy and serves, even though he looks like a thug. He winces with this last statement because this one thing about his looks is a sore topic for him. He then tells them that he wanted to ask them about this house and how they knew he was going to buy this exact one. Amelia tells him that it was not just for this one house. She had already informed the guild that whichever house he wanted to buy, they would pay half for it. He is grateful but is confused about why they would go so far for him. It was because buying a guild house would mean that he is forming a party. And since he was so against on joining their party, she just wanted to know what kind of people changed his mind. If they were deceiving him in any way or something, Gray thinks he is not exactly some clueless novice adventurer. She continues that this is why they came here to meet him, and when she saw six children, it certainly came as a surprise. Nina is getting tired and Aria notices, so she commands all the children to go to bed and takes them with her. Nina tells Gray not to go away, and he responds to her that he won't. He will come back as soon as he is done with things here. As they all depart, Gray mentions how Aria is such a dependable kid. She says that he calls her a kid, but she is more like that, hinting that she plays the role of the wife. Gray is too dense to understand, so he does not get it. As they get ready to leave, he offers to walk them home, and they staunchly refuse, reminding him that no criminals in town stand a chance against them. However, it still is heartwarming how he is so kind and careful towards them. Besides, an entire large criminal organization was taken out about a month ago, with their heads cut completely clean off. Thanks to that, the order and mental peace of the townspeople are much better. Gray does not mention that it was due to his hard work. Aria also comes to see them off, and they apologize for staying so late. She tells them it is alright as it was no problem at all. Any friend of Grayson is welcome at any time, no matter how long they plan on staying or how late at night they come. The thing that irks Amelia the most is the word friend. It feels like an instant jab to her heart and just remains frozen in place. Aria is also stunned by the sudden silence in the air, thinking maybe she said something wrong, but she's unable to put her finger on it. Kasha quickly pulls her away and thanks them for everything one last time. Gray still feels confused as he is not able to understand what this meeting was all about. Aria tells him that they just wanted to meet up with their old friend to see what he's up to, because they care about him so much. He reluctantly agrees, but with a hint of hesitation. Here I am.